welcome to the second annual 2021 Southeast Collaborative Online Conference. My name is Dorcas Davis and I'll be your host for this session. On tech support, we have Lauren from North, North Carolina State Library. And for um, this session, we have the Pre-K Play, um, Play-Based Learning by Mallory McDermott. This event is supported through funding from the Library Services and Technology Act through the Institute of Museum and Library Services. Before we get started, I have a few things to share with you. This session will be recorded and archived. A link will be sent out next week with access to the archive session. If there are other people watching this webinar with you, we'd love to hear about it so that we can have an accurate head count for our records. Please send us an email with the names of the people watching with you. You will have an opportunity to submit text questions for our presenter. Just type them in the chat area and we'll get to them. CEUs are available for this conference session on request. So please contact a conference organizer for more information about that. And now I'd like to introduce Ms. Mallory McDermott. Thank you for being with us, Mallory. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited. All right, can you hear me okay? Perfect. Awesome, okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Um, Pre-K Play is a play-based learning program that was developed for um, children ages three to five. Um, of course, you can have younger and older, but it is developed with um, the cognitive skills and the developmental skills of three to five-year-olds. So let's see here. Moving along. I love this quote. It says, it is a happy talent to know how to play by Ralph Waldo Emerson. So I asked the question, why play-based learning? Play-based learning is, to me is something that is a new concept sort of. Um, I had to give myself as a child the idea that it was okay to play. I always thought I had to be doing something that was very productive, that was educational. I had to go, go, go but I'd forgotten how to play. And so this idea that it is a happy talent to know how to play really resonates with me and is a lot of why I developed um, pre-K play. So um, I am Mallory McDermott at the library from all our kiddos. I am known as Ms. Mal. I work at the Craighead County Jonesboro Public Library in the children's department as a storyteller. So we have an outreach program that we go to the different daycares and preschools around our um, community. And we do story times in their facilities, not just in our own facility. And so we get the title of storyteller, which I absolutely adore. Um, I have the very special privilege of being able to be part of the lives of all of the young people of our community. And I get to help ignite their imaginations, which is just one of my favorite things to do. I am also a mommy of two wonderful kids and they inspire me every day. They inspired me so much that a couple years ago, I started a blog that was not so much a mommy blog, but a just kind of sharing our life story blog. And um, it's been going for two years and it's been really fun and um, captivating to see what all they've taught me. So my leap into the library. My background is actually with education. Prior to coming to the library, I taught high school English. I taught 14 year olds. They were great. They were fun. But um, I found myself lacking the passion that was needed to continue in education. And so I wanted to seek other opportunities, but something that would utilize my training that I had with education. And so um, an opportunity came about the library. I had a friend that worked here, a couple friends actually, and they um, told me about an opportunity that was coming for a part-time a storyteller position and I thought you know this is a good place to try this. So in 2019 I started as the summertime traveling storyteller and very quickly I realized that I wanted to do more in that and so um, my benefit was that after my part-time job had ended for the summer a full-time one became immediately available and then that's when I started with um, CCJPL's children's library as a youth services staff and storyteller. 
So pre-K play, one of my job duties when I started was to be the preschool age in-house and outreach programmer. So there's four storytellers and we all do the outreach stuff and it's very cool. We, we love what we do. We miss getting to see our kiddos now during COVID because everything is shut down and we're mostly virtual. But normally we go in and we see about I, I don't remember if it's two to 3,000 kids every two weeks. And so we really do get to impact our community in that way. But we also have quite a few of that age group that comes into the library. And um, I, I noticed some things. These kids were coming in during the day when other children were at daycares or at preschool. And um, these were the kiddos that mostly stayed home with their adults, their caregivers. And I wanted to figure out a way that wasn't just another story time, don't get me wrong. I love story time and it does amazing things for children and their development and early literacy. But I wanted something that wasn't story time, but still was specific to them. And so I really did ask my question, how could I best serve these kiddos? And so um, I noticed that a lot of the children that were coming in to the library that were this age range of three to five, um, they didn't really know how to interact and behave in the library without absolutely relying on cues that were given to them by their caregivers or us librarians. And those things are normally developed in social settings that happen at daycare or at preschool. And they're very early cues of how you develop. And I, um, realizing that these kiddos, for no lack of like trying from their parents, but like it's that together social interaction of their peers um, that they weren't getting, a light bulb went off for me. And so that is where uh, pre-K play came. And so it is play-based learning set to state education standards because with my background in education, I really wanted to focus on the good things that come from education, the things that I love about education and bring that to the library. Um, it is creative. I personally, in my program, like to bring old school ideas in a more modern setting, but the very most important thing we do is we have fun um, because the kids aren't going to come back if they don't have fun. So what pre-K play ends up looking like? Um, children love to play. They also love it when you play with them. My kids right now are uh, four and five. When I started, they were three and four. And so their favorite thing for me is to play with them. All day, every day, they ask me, mommy, let's play something, let's play something. So all kids really do love to have the adults that surround them play with them. Now the idea is to make that play meaningful and something that they don't get to do every day. And you really do have yourself a winning program. It's finding the things that parents maybe don't wanna do, don't know how to do, um, are too intimidated, overwhelmed, parenting, caregiving, it can be too much sometimes. And so that's where as the support of the library gets to come in. And so um, make it old school. One thing that I found that seems to work every time is the old school way of doing things. It's an old school play activity. The kids adore it. The parents, they usually get a kick out of it because they remember doing it and it unlocks a memory that they haven't gotten to thought about in a while. Things like Red Rover, Venters, Leapfrog, versions of Tag, Red Light, Green Light, Mother Maya, and so many more things that we did as kids that aren't necessarily happening anymore. And um, the kids really seem to love it. Here's some pictures of our kiddos that we see. They, they love it after our sessions end. We do have a few toys when we are getting to do in-house programming that they love to play with. The Legos are always a hit. And this is our light table that is the newest addition to the children's library. Um, something that can be a little overwhelming is the idea that you're entertaining these groups of children in an idea that as a grown up, I haven't necessarily played in a long time. But um, so that idea can be overwhelming and a little difficult. But I really do uh, put this belief of if you believe it's difficult, then it's going to be difficult. If you believe it's fun, it's going to be fun. So don't let the fear of failure keep you from trying these things. The keys really are to just make it fun, let it happen organically, don't overthink it. As adults, that's what we do. We overthink things to death. Let the kids help plan. They love to plan. They will tell you if they like this and they wanna keep doing it. And they will tell you that they hate it and they never wanna do it again. 
three to five year olds, they can be ruthless, but they can also be your best planning partners. The goal of all of this is to make lifelong library patrons. So at CCJPL, we start with the baby. We have a Tiny Tales program that is a lapsed story time where we teach um, caregivers and infants. They get that social interaction. We do finger plays, we do story time, we do play time, and they get to create a community of people in like a support group essentially. And then once they grow up out of Tiny Tales, they can move into pre-K play or if they go to a daycare, they have our outreach program. And once they grow through that, they have our school age, which is always fun. And we do story time and we have after school things. And um, right now we're doing art kits that go home with them. And then once they grow through that, they enter our tweens phase. And our tweens are doing amazing. That's a recent thing that we've revamped during the quarantine. And let me tell you, it's fun. And then from tweens to teens and teens to adults, we want lifelong library patrons with memories through every phase of life that they loved the library. And that's our goal. And so this is something um, I wanted my coworkers to give me um, their opinion of pre-K play because it really was different than anything else we were doing. And so I wanted their honest opinions. So Ms. Sloan is our assistant manager in children's and she says, Ms. Mao's intentionality is the key to pre-K play success. She plans high quality engaging activities that meet preschool standards, entertain our youngest patrons and provide caregivers with activities to increase school readiness. It's definitely the most fun hour at our library. They're very complimentary of me, but, um, and I appreciate them so much. I love my coworkers. And this AJ, she is our tween queen. She started this program and has made it fly in our uh, department and it's amazing. She says, Miss Mal created pre-K play and on launch day, we had 15 people, which was really incredibly overwhelming when we were used to running less than 10. Our patrons loved it so much. The group doubled in size by the next week and pre-K play is our best program and it would never happen without Ms. Mouse. Again, they are very complimentary to me. The program could be run by anyone and that's the whole, like I wanted to share this because the way it's being, I'm developing it is anybody can do this and it makes itself succeed. It's, it's a really cool program. I'm very excited about it. Um, like I said earlier, I do have a blog and I was so passionate about pre-K play and all it has to offer. I've created a, a Monday series on my blog um, called Building Better Humans. And so um, it's something that I want everybody to know, not just people who work with children in libraries, but schools can adapt it, stay at home moms, homeschooling, Anyone that interacts with children can take ideas from pre-K play and really make it their own. And that blog is bloom and racecom If you wanna go see more content there, I would be happy to share that with you. Um, here are my library socials and my socials. So Facebook, you can find us at CCJPL. You can see videos, you can see um, pictures that go up and all the things that we share. That um, Bloom and Grace blog is my blog's Facebook page. And we have YouTube videos that go up at Craighead County Jonesboro Public Library. And we do lots of things for all of our um, programs there. And they're very fun, I highly recommend. And so um, I want you to talk to me. I want to answer your questions. Um, if you don't feel like you can, or if I don't get to your question here, that is my email. Feel free to email me any questions. Again, this is the blog website. You can go on there and ask me questions. And here's my phone number. I welcome text messages. Um, I can't promise that if you call me, I would answer because I don't always answer my phone, but I can try and get back to any text messages. But um, yeah, so I am ready to answer questions. Let me stop share and see what that looks like. Oh, I do want to show you these too. I'm so sorry. Um, this is my binder. This is what I plan everything for. Um, in here, I keep my um, core, common core standards, and I always reference them when I'm doing my lesson plans. And then I have all of my lesson plans. And on every lesson plan after I do the program that day, I write notes, how many people we had, what worked, what didn't, so that when I go back and plan other things, I, I have those notes to make it better because I never want to do something that the kids don't enjoy. Um, we do often use props and I wanted to show you a couple of our props. We have these egg shakers. We just take Easter eggs, 
fill them with rice or beans or something. Let me tell you, these are a big hit. We also use scarves. Um, I keep them in this little uh, Kleenex box and we just pull them out, we play with them. We do all kinds of fun things with them to engage their um, gross motor skills. We engage their cognitive skills. And sometimes when we do big like yoga sessions, we like to use these kinds of big carpet pots that are really fun. Um, that way they're spread out and not knocking into each other because they are still three and five. They don't always um, you know, mind their uh, spaces. So the carpets really help them. All right, so now if you have any questions, I would, I would love to answer. Okay. Mallory, we do have some in the chat with you to put some questions in. Okay, good deal. Let's see, I'm gonna try and scroll to the top. Sure, so a typical program, I will do the one that we did right before we shut down for um, the quarantine. So the question is, could you give us a step-by-step -step of what a typical program would look like? So this one was a pre-K playtime called Move Like Animals, and it was a gross motor movement lesson. And so the setup which I do about 15 minutes before the kiddos show up, we have a programming area and I try and get it all ready to go there. Um, in parallel lines with tape that are like jumping distance for three to five year olds apart. And I use our rugs to set them in a semicircle. We start, um, I set the children in a semicircle using the rugs. I welcome everyone. I introduce myself every time because one time we may have all a certain group of kids, the next time a whole new set of kids. So I always introduce myself every time and let them know what's happening. Because if they know what to expect, they are usually better behaved. Um, I ask questions like, how did you get to the library today? How do people get places? Because this was all on movement. I wanted them to say, did we walk? Did we ride a car? Did we ride a bus? Um, all these things. And then we moved on to animals. How do these animals move? Um, and we would go through a list of animals that I have flashcards for. And then I will explain to them, today is going to be about moving like animals. And so we would do a warm up, and my warm up would consist of deep breathing, because I want everybody to get focused. And deep breathing is a good focusing exercise that I like to teach them. So I teach my own kids at home when we're having meltdowns or things. But deep breathing really does refocus our energy. And so it works in the, with the group as well. We uh, would point and flex our feet just to get those um, fine motor skills going. We would use our fingers, many stretches because we are gonna be doing moving and I want everybody to stay safe. And then from our warm up, we would move into what I had planned that day. So we did a kangaroo hop, we did balancing monkey walk, we did a dinosaur stomp, we did leapfrog. And then I have a wind down song that I like to use which is happy and you know it, by the group Go Fish, it's super fun and we wind down with that. And so that's a typical day. I try to get it to where it lasts about 30 minutes. The parents can join in or sit on the sidelines. And then after that 30 minutes, um, they are free to roam the library and that's where they usually like to play with our um, toys and things that we get to have out sometimes. And so that's a typical day. Mallory, do you mind sharing um, your contact information again? I do see a lot Absolutely. of um, questions, um, um, requests for that. And also, Absolutely. do you mind um, going in a little deeper about the story time? We do have a, a couple of questions, a few questions about the story time. So do you do traditional story time? Um, or how is this different than, than the regular story time, the typical story time? And um, did you say that you do a more traditional story time with the elementary students? Absolutely. All right, so here is my contact information and I'll just tell you a little more about um, what our different story times look. So for this age group, we have my pre-K play, which is all the play-based learning. We have um, our in-house story time, which is a traditional story time. We do books, we do a craft, we do sing songs. Um, uh, we do an activity and that's all in-house and these happen on different days. And then our outreach program is also that in-house story time program taking to their own facilities. So we roughly do about 20 minute story times where we do a book, some sort of movement activity, 
um, activating all of their early literacy components. Does that answer your question? Do you have any pictures of your story times and activities that you can share with us? I do. I am going to leave this page. And we'll go back over here. So here is the pre-K play. This is the part where um, we do our, this was our yoga session we did, where we use our, um, there's our carpets that we use and all of our kiddos. Um, so I really do encourage parents to get in there and play because like I said, kids love that adults play with them. And so here we have um, one mom who is really excited to do this, but we also have some parents that are a little insecure in doing playing things because it's not something we get to do often. Um, and so here we are doing yoga. And then um, after our sessions is when we do a little bit of a free play. Here's the Lego table we have and our light table we have and our kiddos love these things. Um, Pre-K play is very flexible because there are days we come in and I have a plan and I have it beautifully lesson planned, but um, the kids may not be feeling it. The weather might be gross and it's just like, they're not feeling it. So I like to have options. I always have a plan B and a, usually a plan C in place because three to five year olds, they need the flexibility. Hey, uh, Mallory, I think somebody mentioned this on the chat. How did you manage the um, capacity issue? Like, you know, how many people supposed to be in that space? Look like you have a very large space, but sometimes I wonder that might also relate it to, you might only have so many props, you know, on a given day. And how do you manage those kind of things? Sure, so um, when I have a large group, so the first time we had pre-K play, we had about 15, which was about the max that I was prepared for. It, I was not prepared for more than that. So the next week when we literally doubled our numbers, um, I pulled in that flexibility idea. I, uh, we took turns and we just um, monitored and adjusted, which is a good theme for um, programs at the library. I um, will set up centers for them. And so like here where we have Lego time and the light table time, the light table is like high, he, everybody wants the light table, but it's not big enough to fit everybody. So you really do just monitor and, and make um, suggestions that we share time and we swap and we create those ideas. Um, our programming space is pretty large, but we also have a room in our library called the round room that we rent out to the public to use. And it's quite large. I can fit quite a few kids in there if we ever exceeded our programming area. But um, I also, my coworkers are very helpful. And um, if it's more than I can handle, they are more than willing to step in with me. I really do have a great team that helps me with anything I need. Mallory, can you give us a little bit um, of more information about your outreach program? Sure, so our outreach program um, was developed before I um, started working here, but it's, so there's four storytellers and we split um, our daycares and preschools up that we go to. So the general rule is if the facility has a library in it with someone that does library time, we don't go there because they have the ability to do these story times themselves. However, sometimes they need the help and we are more than willing. And so we, um, Anybody that wants to participate, we give them the opportunity. We set up a schedule that, of a time that works for them for us to come in. And so we go into these facilities. And for instance, I'll talk about mine specific. I go into a facility with my coworker, Miss AJ, who we have the same facility, but it's a very large one. So she does a set of classrooms and I do a set of classrooms. We go in and what that generally looks like is we have 20 minutes. And so we'll go into the classroom. We gather the kiddos up on their, on their circle time area because most uh, facilities have a circle time area. And we um, gather them around. We do a, a welcoming song. We have one or two books. Usually I start with a good solid, Pete the Cat's always a good one to start with to see and kind of gauge where we're at for the day. And um, we do Pete the Cat. We do our uh, early literacy components, whether it's working with vocabulary, it's working with, um, 
phonemic awareness, um, phonological orders, things of that nature. We do a lot of sequencing. And after our reading of the story, we will, um, I, I like to do a movement because they're, they're small. They like to move. It is just how they are. And so we do a, a fun song. I often use my closing song for pre-K play, um, Happy and You Know It, as my middle ground song. And then I'll read another book generally. And after that book, using the same literacy components, um, we all sing Skinnamarink um, as our final song. All the kids have learned it at this point, and they sing along with us to signify that it's time for us to go. And our library kiddos, they love it. It's so fun. And so um, we do that just about every day. During COVID times, we have adjusted to virtual, so we do Zooms with our uh, kiddos. And so on Mondays, of the first of the month, I have, not Mondays, Tuesdays, I get to go to one of our facilities to go, and it is all um, virtual, but it's about 200 kiddos, and they get to do it, and it is so fun to see their faces. We do lots of interaction with weight, raising our hands, sitting and standing, and so um, that's just our outreach program in a nutshell. Okay, so um, someone, well, a couple of people have asked what's been um, some of the favorite activities and also what's, what play has been um, consistently popular? Absolutely. So our most popular, the one that really, my first one that I did that doubled our numbers and really that word of mouth spread because moms liked it, the kids liked it, was an obstacle course. Obstacle courses are really fun. Let me see if I can find the lesson plan for it. They're really fun because they're easy to set up. I use painter's tape, masking tape, pillows. We have some giant stuffed animals that we use. Um, I use our uh, little A-framed um, whiteboards and we really work on gross motor skills but also um, social and emotional skills. So um, I literally just use tape to set up some sort of obstacle course. It's squares that they hop in. Um, I'll use it to create um, letters or numbers that we go over. And so um, let's see. we always start with a stretch on an obstacle course because I tell them, you know, we've got to stretch to make sure our muscles are ready to do all the fun things we're about to do. And we, we really focus here in obstacle course, not just the doing the set properly, but taking turns because that's something that kids that don't go to institutions like daycares or preschools really struggle with because they don't have to at home, it's just them. And even if it's brother or sister that's there, they don't have to take turns like you do when you're with a group of people. And so it's a really good time to talk to the children and parents about the importance of these social dynamics that need to develop. But obstacle course, you cannot go wrong with an obstacle course. And when it's nice outside, we even take it outside with chalk, which is always a hit. So what are some of your most used resources when planning um, and getting ideas for, for your program? That was sure. I, I like to use YouTube um, is a big for anything you can I tell people you can learn anything on YouTube but it really started with me staying home with my two kiddos we found something that I really enjoyed um and it was called Cosmic Kids Yoga her name is Miss Jamie she does an amazing job if you don't know about her or you've never used her in any of your programming highly recommend she tells stories while doing yoga with the kiddos and encourage them my daughter is five and she's been doing it since she was three and she does all of them she loves Miss Jamie. I also am very um, obsessed, might be a good word, with like the Danish way of doing things. And so the Danish way of parenting, um, there's a book that I just um, am currently reading called No Bad Weather. And it talks about like Scandinavian styles and the point of our kids spend all of their time from a young age in an institution and that idea of they don't know how to play and they don't know how to do these basic things that we think they should. Um, it talks about bringing that back and what that can look like in a real 
physical way. And so I read a lot of that, um, but really it's just trial and error. I do like YouTube, Pinterest, um, those are great things. I follow a lot of mommy blogs, um, but really I just try it at home with my kids. That's what it boils down to. What, what um, activates my children's imagination? Would this work in a group setting? And um, I try to be as original in my content as possible because I, I like to give credit where credit is due, but um, I like to pride myself too in that I come up with some fun things to do, which is why I've started putting it on the blog so that I can share it with other people. Mallory, I think you mentioned it briefly, but will you share with us how COVID has changed things for you? Um, this question comes from Donna. And also, what's the maximum number of children that you take per session um, since COVID? Sure. So since COVID, we are actually not doing any in-program, in-house programming, which is very sad because everything I do, Tiny Tales and Pre-K Play, are very socially interactive things. And so what we have done in the COVID times is created it virtually. I did a YouTube stint of Kids in the Kitchen where um, I talk about the importance of taking your kids in the kitchen, letting them at young ages do things that maybe we wouldn't necessarily think about being important. But um, so we've done that. And I'm also currently getting ready to launch a program that they get to take home. So I have themes that I'm doing every week. And so one week we do pre-K play. So it's all activity based. I put an activity book from our collection, a fun DVD, a CD to take home. And I build a packet of like um, the lesson plans or the, the things that I use to do the program. I'm sending things like that home with our kiddos um, that they get to check out. So it not only moves our collection but also is that specific pre-K play design. So it is designed for those groups of kiddos. Anybody can check it out, but it is designed for them. I'm also doing Kids in the Kitchen, which is where I send home a cookbook, um, recipes that they can do with their kids, a movie that's based on food and um, a packet of information of how to teach your children in the kitchen. We're also doing a family game night where I include old school paper games like tic-tac-toe and how to play how to teach and how to play um, rock, paper, scissors, um, old school things like that. And then if we can somehow figure out a way to send games home, I would love to get to there. And then our last one that I do, because I do a stint of four, is a nature one where we do nature walks and we move our collection on nature and a, a packet on nature and a DVD and CD. Um, and so it really is trial and error during COVID. I miss having our kiddos in house um, because that really is a great thing. Um, so we don't have any numbers that are like specific to times right now, but um, our virtual YouTube has been like, we just use the view. So there's not a limit on that. Um, what I'm planning for the take home packets is I'm planning 10 per week and I will make more if midweek we are out. And so um, my think is 10 per week is probably a good and it'll change every week. So people can come back and recur every week or if they just wanna take one home for the month, they can. Does that answer your question? And Mallory, one person asked, could you share more information about kids in the kitchen? Absolutely, I would love to. So I ran across this idea in passing. I couldn't honestly tell you where that kids need responsibilities. And I 100% agree. My four and five-year-old, I cannot keep them out of the kitchen. And, and so I just thought one day, had this thought run into my brain, let them help. Let them do something in the kitchen so that I'm not constantly being like, get out of the kitchen. And so instead of letting them in the kitchen and giving them specific jobs, my daughter's specific job right now, she's five in the kitchen. She, when we are doing dishes, she puts all of the silverware away. That is her job. Um, my four-year-old, he um, has the attention span of a fly. So his, his varies mostly. He puts all the trash in the trash can and those are their specific jobs. Um, so when I'm cooking or baking cookies, especially, they get to help me put um, the dough on the cookie sheet. These are jobs that are specific. And eventually I had them stand with me the whole time and I talk through what I'm doing so that they know 
so that one day when they're old enough and they are showing that they have the maturity to work the kitchen, they know what they're doing already. So I really am just bringing them in as assistants in the kitchen. And we work on knife skills with first a butter knife with something very easy to cut. And we will slowly, that's what we're working on now with my daughter, Rowan. She loves it. We are cutting marshmallows with butter knives. So it's a little sticky and fun, but she gets a good treat out of it. Um, next, we're going to move on to um, something a little harder. We haven't decided. We're thinking it's going to be a boiled potato, but things of that nature, just working on those skills that they need in the kitchen that they'll need for adulthood, but working on it now, but in a fun way. So one person asked, how early can you introduce the kids in the kitchen program? Absolutely. I have a one-year-old niece. And I like to bring her in the kitchen just for being in the kitchen so that she learns what we're doing. So as we're teaching her vocabulary, um, we talk about things that are hot and things that are cold. And I'll put her hands like on ice and she'll play with ice in the floor with us while we're cooking. Um, and so I think as early as you as the adult feels comfortable with really breaking it down, bring like simple things that you wouldn't normally think of wet and dry cold and hot or warm, um, squishy and hard. Things of that nature are, are very important in the kitchen. And if you, in my opinion, if you wait till later, they're never gonna wanna be in the kitchen because it's intimidating and overwhelming. So I think as young as you feel comfortable. Um, one person asked, do you use music and dancing movements in your programs? Absolutely. We love music. Um, we start usually with music unless it's a pretty intense day, uh, but we'll start with music. We will end with music every time. Um, one that we like to do is um, go through, I like to build a playlist on YouTube of all the fun kids songs like The Floor is Lava, um, The Freeze Dance Game, let's see, Baby Fit or Baby Shark. <laughs> baby shark is always as much as we hate it it is always a success and um i run these kids around to where when they go home with mom and mom or whoever they came with they're gonna take a nap and so um music is like key i play music in the background regardless what we're doing because um, it's it's happiness for me and the kiddos and i even at home with my own too i play music all the time And Mallory, do you have a budget to plan these programs? Um, so pre-K play being fairly new, we haven't discussed a budget. Um, a lot of the things that I use, we already had for other programs. Um, but I honestly think that you can get away with the stuff you have at your library already. So something that I uh, haven't shown you yet, we make these calm down bottles. Let's see. I don't know if you can see this. Can you see me? Let's see. Yes. Yeah. Okay, cool. And so we make these calm down bottles. I drink these um, waters out of these bottles. And so I save them and I run them through a sanitized um, on the dishwasher and we fill it with a little glue, water and glitter. And it fascinates our kiddos. And so I really do just utilize what we already have. Um, Easter eggs from my kiddos after Easter, we use that and a bag of rice or beans and we fill that and that's our shakers. Um, so for me, no, I don't use Eliza budget. I use what we have so that way parents really can go home and imitate this at home for little to no cost because um, I want everybody to be able to do the things we do. I don't want anybody to feel excluded because they don't have the money for it. So Mallory, what is your favorite program of all the programs that you do? Which one is your very favorite? And can you kind of describe that for us from start to finish? Absolutely. So my favorite thing that we do in pre-K play along with the kiddos is the obstacle course. It is the most fun that we have. So what, um, the, the, I, what I consider to be the key most fun we've had during a pre-K play session is um, the kiddos came in and they saw the tape on the floor so they knew it was obstacle course day 
And so I drew out a very complicated obstacle course with a maze. And we go through sections of hopping on one foot and then switching to another. But my absolute favorite thing is to get their adults that they came with involved because seeing adults transform back into children in a way that has enriched their lives for that day, it, it changes the game for me as a library uh, person. It, I, I don't know what it does. It sparks joy in me because then I also get to play but in a way that's so meaningful because they may not remember the book we read that day, but they're going to remember the most fun they had at the library being that time mom or dad or Miss Mal or auntie or grandma played with them at the obstacle course. And so what those generally look like are we start with tape and we pop into some sort of fashion. I use, usually do a maze. And then we have our pillows where we hop over the pillows. That way if we fall on the pillows or we're not cognitively there and developmentally there to hopping, it's soft and it doesn't hurt us. And then we army crawl underneath our uh, A-frame stands. And that's always fun. I usually do um, an area where we have paper that they get to make a mess through. Um, Miss Mal is fairly messy. She makes a mess with her programs, but very willing to clean up because mess is fun. And we just do it over and over until we don't want to do it anymore. And, or until my time is up. We usually set aside an hour from 10 to 11 normally. And then it's time kiddos go home, take naps, eat lunch. And uh, anytime we do obstacle course, we last the whole hour. And thank you. That was, that's great. Um, one person asked, do you have stations or does everyone do everything at the same time? Uh, when I set up stations, um, so for pre-K play, when we have it in-house, I go ahead and set up stations because we don't have space at every station for every kid to play at one time. That way I can more adequately and efficiently make them share. And what I'll usually do is use a bell or some sort of sound that is funny because um, that'll get their attention. I'm like, okay, time to swap. And so they'll swap stations. And little to rarely do we ever have a problem of sharing those centers or stations. Mallory, how long is a typical um, program? Generally, 30 minutes to 45 minutes is always my goal. Um, obstacle courses always last an hour. Um, yoga is one of those that it is fairly structured, so that usually lasts about 30 minutes, but no more than an hour because by that point they're getting tired and they're getting a little cranky. So, One person asked, are carege caregivers are required for your programs, is that correct? Um, yes, ma'am. So they are required to stay in children. So we're not, we don't allow anybody under the age of eight to stay without an adult, the adult that brought them or, um, so they do have to stay as for most of my programs. Um, a lot of my parents do participate, so it's never been a big deal. Um, but they do often will just sit on the sidelines and uh, is not too much of a, of a, a headache. Only I think a couple of times have we had to take children to their parents that left the programming area, but usually parents are pretty good about staying with their kids. We have one question that says, have you done your pre-K play in a virtual setting? And if you do, do you provide props or how do you accommodate the virtual setting? Sure, we haven't yet. It's been a lot of talk and how to do that. And I, on all honesty, I would if I could figure out how to do it. I know it would take some sort of take home kit. I don't know then if we do things to where it's in the budget that I can send them home for them to keep and we do something regularly. But as of right now, we haven't done it virtually besides me doing a stint of kids in the kitchen where I talk to them about what they can do. Um, but a lot of our things that we've moved virtual have been things you can do at home or kits that we do send home. So we do have regular kits that go home for our school age. We have an art kit that goes home. We have um, our tween kits go home. I'm developing something maybe for our babies to take home that they can do. And so that's what we've been calling a hybrid programming. So you come, you see us, we talk about what is in the kit, you take it home and you get to do it.
one person asked, what is in a tween kit? So I can talk about the one that's going out this week. Miss AJ, um, with spring coming, she has um, a good budget of, and she has a good group of kiddos. So she has sent home this, she does one a month. So this month she's sending home a potting kit where they get to decorate their own little terracotta pot. She sends home the little pot, um, paint pots full of paint, a paintbrush, and this month also a marker so that they can decorate it because uh, several of our kits that are going home in the library are all garden themed. Our tween kit this, um, this week is a stepping stone that they get to create. So it's concrete that they get to mix up and decorate into a stepping stone. And I think our adult kit might be fairy garden, which is pretty fun. One person asked, because this is such a physical program, when you have uncoordinated kids, do you, do kids get hurt? No, we, I'm very conscious of um, being an uncoordinated child growing up myself. I'm very clumsy still to this day. Um, I'm very conscious of space that if we're doing something that is very balance based or something where we're going to be doing exercises, we sometimes do like a PE warm up exercise. I make sure we're spread out. If we can't spread out, then I'm not going to do it because I don't want anybody getting hurt. And so far, that hasn't been a problem. What kind of um, attendance numbers do you have for your Zoom gathering? X, yeah, someone X, just X. Sure, so for our Zoom story times we've done, um, I, um, have, I have two classes that I do at the beginning of the month and um, it's a whole facility. So usually this facility would be one that Miss AJ and I split up, but it's 200 children total and then 10 teachers, 20 teachers. And so I get to count 220 people on that Zoom. And then my other Zoom has been with a smaller daycare. And so that one is a 22 total. And so um, we get to count those numbers anytime we show up at a Zoom call day and they show up. Another person asked, how do you incorporate the school state standards into pre-K play? Absolutely. So um, I always keep my standards at the front of my planning front of my planning book, and I focus a lot on gross motor as well as fine motor. But um, I thought it would be fun to pull in all of the standards because my education background is what my education heart loves. And so I printed them and I put them in front of my planning book, and I just make sure that when I am looking at a certain activity that I want to try what standards fit here. And I really do make the standards fit the activity. Um, and as someone, I am familiar with standards and how they work for someone that is not, um, printing them out and, and you can easily find online um, standards that are written in more colloquial speech, which is um, what I have printed. Because then for instance, um, say I wanted to do something with um, self-awareness and self-esteem for the kiddos. Um, they want to demonstrate awareness of abilities and preferences. So this is where we do things like um, the taking of turns. Like we go from youngest to oldest. They're able to differentiate who is younger and who is older, and then they take the turn. So that is their social and emotional standard of self-awareness and self-esteem. And so that alone is, is encompassing an entire set of standards. Okay, we have quite a few questions, so just sure. Um, so someone asked, do you have a disclaimer that you use? They said, I'm guessing you don't have anyone to sign waivers or anything like that. I don't. I do tell parents, you know, that's why we do require you to be here for to help monitoring. If there's something that you don't particularly like or don't want your child to participate in, perfectly fine. Um, you know, you just pull your child out. I am very aware of making sure we're not hitting, we're not biting. I don't want any of that to happen on my watch. It never has. Um, but we just, I let the parents know that you are still in charge of your child. 
I am just facilitating an activity. Another question was, do you offer Zoom story times for children who are not in a daycare? We do um, a Facebook Live every Tuesday at 10. So that's anybody that follows our Facebook page. Um, we don't have a Zoom right now for anybody that wants to attend. We are looking at maybe doing some options for babies via Zoom, but since we do the Facebook Live that is open to the public, we don't. And is this a drop-in program as well as one that visits daycares? Um, I have not taken pre-K play to daycares. It is something that I just recently thought about when we do go back doing something like that with them as a part of like our story time and developing um, more simplified versions to take with us or even offering it to um, talking to my team if it's something they would be interested in doing and going in another time. But that's just something that we've talked about. It's not something we've actually put to paper. And are all of your Zooms like live, or your, I got you talked about Facebook, your Facebook lives, or are they recorded and put somewhere for uh, repeated viewing? So we do have a YouTube private playlist that our daycares can use for anything that they want. We give access to that. Um, due to publishers' rights, we do take things down. Um, in the time that they allot, so different publishers, depending on what we're reading. Um, and um, Penguin Random House does a really good job of letting us utilize their stuff. And so um, we do that for any time we're doing lives or um, like for World Read Aloud Day, we did all things, make sure, because we don't want the publishers to be offended by what we're doing, but we also want our patrons to be able to access the things that they normally would in a non-COVID year. Another question is, how do you play Red Rover if the kids aren't actually having physical contact with each other? Sure, so on when it's nice outside, I do like to talk to my parents, especially if I have a group of my older kids. So my range is three to five-year-olds, but there are times when just my five-year-olds show up. When my five-year-olds show up, I like to do things that they would normally do in a school or like we did in school. Um, and so I talk to the parents, are you okay with this? And if they are, then we play Red Rover. If they're not, then we are flexible and we try something else. And so just open communication with the parents is really key here. And most of the time they don't care. And if they do care, they just tell their kid they're gonna do something else and they might go do something else. And someone asked, did you say that you do a pre-K story time in addition to my pre-K play? And did you say that you do an elementary story time as well? Yes, so we do um, all of our programs that we do, I'm gonna pretend it's not COVID and we're open for all in-house programming. We do um, a baby story time that we call Tiny Tales. So for ages zero to two years, 24 months. And then we do a preschool school age story time. So that does include um, my pre-K play kiddos. That is just an in-house story time. Then we also do my pre-K play, which is not story time based, but it is um, standard based. And then um, we have after school in the afternoons programs for um, all school age children. And do you send your class information to the daycares for them to join your classes? We do. So if they, we do um, at the beginning of each semester is what I kind of call them. Um, we call our daycares and say who would be interested in doing Zoom, who would be interested in receiving crafts. So we do have a craft program as well with our outreach program where we send about 2,000 to 3,000 crafts out into the community, um, all provided by the public library. Um, and so they get to sign up for if they want crafts, if they want flannel boards that we create, or if they want Zoom. Sometimes they want all three, sometimes they don't want anything, and sometimes they want just crafts. And so we um, want to give them opportunities to, we weren't prepared to do Zoom, but now we would like to. So as we come up to summer, we are going to call them again, see who would like to do summer sessions. That way they're getting as much out of us as they can with what they want.
Another question is, what do your after school programs look like? Are you doing Zoom after school programs? Not right now we aren't. Um, we do offer homework help that we could set up Zooms for. It hasn't proven to be a problem yet or something that's wanted by our kiddos that do um, do the, the school age things. But prior to COVID, we did different theme days. So we would have an art day, we would have a STEM day, we would have um, a science or like engineering day specifically. It was quite fun and you would have um, an array of people that would come. Sometimes you'd have some programs that were very um, high key and lots of kiddos and then some you'd have, oh, it's not for me and they go on with their day. And do you have, do you, does your library have a plan to go back 100% in person? Um, it's still in the works. Um, I think we do want to go back to in-person. I don't know that we will ever be done doing virtual because it has proven to be so handy and um, inclusive for people, but I do believe we will go back to 100% in-person at some point. Okay, well, I think that's, that's it for the questions. Fun fact, everybody. Um, my very first job was with the Craig Keck County Public Library. So way to go, Mallory. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank y'all for having me. Um, this has been so fun. Really, when I created this program, I fell in love with it and I'm still in love with it. And I want to tell everybody about it. Wonderful. Well, thank you again, Mallory, for being here today. And Absolutely. thank you, everyone, for attending our webinar. If you do have any other questions, please don't hesitate to contact your State Library's Continuing Education Coordinator.